Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Fabiana Bacchini. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. And since the beginning of this pandemic, we've been uh, doing Facebook Lives twice a week to talk to experts, clinicians, and parents from all over Canada. And today I have a guest from Switzerland uh, to talk about fathers and then I see you. The whole week, we're going to be talking about fathers and dads, uh, how they're coping with then I see you, because you're leading to Father's Day here in Canada. And today I have the pleasure to uh, talk to Alexander Regi, who is also Brazilian like me, and he's a lawyer and the father of twin girls born at 30 weeks gestational. And since the birth of his daughters eight years ago, Alex wanted to support preemie fathers as he realized that the mothers always had some kind of support while dads had none or their role wasn't well defined. He decided to start a group for fathers to connect. Alex, who lives in Switzerland, is launching Hospital Daddy, a new online platform for NICU dads from around the world. Alex, welcome and thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I'm really glad we managed to to get this going. Thank you. That's wonderful. So I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to start from the very beginning of your journey uh, in the NICU. Just describe for us how that moment when you first saw your daughters in the NICU, born at 30 weeks, how did you feel? How was everything for you at that moment in time? The scariest thing I have ever lived, I guess. Um, they, they, I mean, it was all of a sudden. It was a Friday. I was having lunch with my team at a bank. And then all of a sudden, my wife calls and, you know, just boom, hospital. And three, three hours later, I was having, you know, the kids. So I, was, I could look at them, but they couldn't realize, you know, what was really going on. I was super confused, uh, scary. It was scary because you know you don't you don't understand you know all those people around, and people. They, I remember that people were talking to me and I couldn't understand. You know, not because of the language, but it was like I couldn't understand what they were talking, and I just concentrated on looking to the kids. But then they were separated because one of them was you know in a poor uh, health condition in terms of you know the first signs that they check. So I couldn't, I mean, I, we were split it. So my wife was taken care of. Uh, one of the kids uh, went, uh, I don't know where. I just met her afterwards. And then the one that, you know, the, it was not in the best shape ever. Then she went to this little room that was on the side of the, you know, the, of the, the, the room. The delivery room? Delivery room, yeah. And then when I entered there, uh, I remember that that's very that was very strong for me. I was I was so out of my in normal that uh, I told myself I I need to I I, I cannot faint because the, the impression I had I was going to faint, and then I just started to count the feet of the people in the room, and I counted every every <laughs> every feet I saw I counted until I got to the to the bed where my kid was. And then the the what I saw there, it was scary because I, I actually couldn't see the kid. I could see a lot of wires and everything. So it was a tough moment. Oh, I, I bet it is. I think all, all of us parents can relate to that moment mm-hmm. when you first see uh, a premature baby because that's not the image we have in our minds when you see a newborn baby. But I want to, when you're talking before, you told me that in Switzerland, you actually move into the hospital with yes. your wife and you spend two months in the hospital. Yeah. This is something that is very new for us in Canada. Um, hospitals are still moving to that mode of care where parents can actually uh, stay in, in private rooms, in hospitals. So tell us how was your experience there? Because I know you had uh, the two girls in different nurseries. One was, a, I, I believe, in a level two, the other one in a level three, within yeah. the same hospital, but not attached to the same building. Yes. So how was that experience for you? That, that was a, a triathlon. <laughs> because I, 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 my wife was in the room in one building. So she had to you know, take the milk uh, with the machine. One kid was in one NICU in another building, 
and the other one was in the level three on the other building. So I, I needed to go to my wife first, take the bottles of milk, take to the one daughter, and then go back and go up to the other uh, building. And this was not a very good sight because it was winter, it was fall, you know, but it was very cold, remember? And then they have passages underground. So I used to go underground uh, and then I had to pass in front of the mark every time. And that was kind of, after a while, I just couldn't go. I, I preferred to put all the coats on, go out, and then instead of going uh, through the, you know, to, to the underground. And then the private rooms, uh, that was new for us as well, because I told, I told the lady, uh, look, we live far away from the hospital. I work in another, I mean, imagine a triangle. So our house on the top, my work on, on one edge and the a hospital in the other. It was, if I counted, it was almost 60 kilometers per day if I had to do the three. So doing only the hospital work, it was okay. But then uh, my wife needed to stay there because you know she needed to go to the NICU and then after, and you have a limit to stay in the room that you are. Then you have to move some, some, somewhere else. And then in the hospital of Geneva, they have these rooms that private foundations care for. So there are two private foundations that care for these two rooms, that, which one of them we stayed. And there's another, uh, it's not in the hospital, it's by a chain of fast food that you know, sponsors a, 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 a whole house, but that, that was full that day. The, the day we needed to, to go in. So the room was, it was a hospital room, you know, like hospital beds. And we live, we literally lived there for uh, almost two months, you know, and, uh, and the experience was, uh, I mean, it was a comfort, I must admit, because, you know, it, it was, I can, I can even dare to say it was a luxury because we didn't know, I didn't need to go back home mm -hmm. and we could be there, you know, because everyone that is here knows how it feels that if you need to go and leave your kid in the hospital. So for us, that was a no-go. We even thought about renting a room in a, a hotel or anything around not to go, you know, we needed to stay close. So that room was very, very good for us. And I think it is something a lot of NICUs around the world are looking to, to have this design where parents can actually yeah. stay connect with, with the child. And sometimes yes. we know the difficulties if you have other children at home to stay in those rooms. And I know here in Canada, we have Ronald McDonald's house close to a lot of hospitals. And it's always a challenge, right? Yeah. When you live far or you have to drive every day back and forth, uh, forth from, the, hotel, from yeah. the hospital. But the fact that we are trying to look into that worldwide to keep the families together, I think it's a, it's a good thing for families that, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about your role in the NICU. How did you find your role in the NICU? Barking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it, it, it was a funny, funny thing because um, my wife and I, we were, we were alone here. I mean, our families there, they were either in Spain or in Brazil. And uh, we kind of built this, you know, this teamwork. And I had to do a lot of the admin stuff. And not necessarily the people dealing with the admin stuff in the hospital are your best friends. And then from there, I, I went back to the, to the NICU and 90% of the time we are treated amazingly well. However, there were those 10% of the time that we got into conflicts with some nurses. And then, I, I mean, because I'm used to be informed of what's going on. And sometimes we were just not informed. And for us, I mean, I, need, I, I wanted to know what was going on with the kid. What are those lights? What is that shade in the eyes? I mean, can you explain me? Oh, you don't need to know. Like, what? And that was, you know, uh, when I started to stand up. And then, then I was nicknamed as German Shepherd. <laughs> so did you, <laughs> how did you feel about that? 
you you might take as a compliment in in some aspects of your life, but others uh, you might not. So how did you feel having that nickname? Because also I, I believe there is a lot of cultural differences, right? When you live in another country and you experience another healthcare system. Because I experienced the same here in Canada, being an immigrant, and you know we we deal with uh, the situations differently culturally. So how was that for you? Uh, well, it was huge because, you know, uh, in, in, back in Brazil, I mean, first we have a lot of doctors in our families, both my, my family and my wife's family. And obviously we we're in close contact, you know, what's up the whole day, you know, this happened and picture of this. And, and they, when they saw that we were taking pictures of the, you know, the charts and everything, they, they started to hide it for months because they used to take a picture and send back to, you know, to the people in Brazil. So do you think it's okay? And then here we found out that this is not something that parents do and they should not do. So that was the first shock. Second shock is that, you know, uh, Swiss doctors tend to be more straight to the point, which is great. But when are you fragilized? That might be a bit harsh. So that was tough. And then I think, you know, the German shepherd thing just came as a response, you know, like, help me. I mean, it was asking for help, actually. Right. Did you feel misunderstood? Oh, yeah. Many yeah, many times. Many times. Because we, I mean, we, we just wanted to be informed about, going, I mean, because the, the, the question you have in the back of your mind the whole time when you're in the hospital is, will my kids survive? And sometimes you need to ask that 10 times a day. And people just, they, they might have had a bad day. I mean, they're humans as we are. So, and sometimes the answer didn't come and then I would insist. And then this could be taken, you know, like as, you know, going up beyond, you know, what we should do as parents. But as you also talk about how you felt they were tested in your role as a caregiver in the hospital. How was that? Tested in which sense? Uh, when you're chatting before, you said they feel that like they were testing or to see if you are good oh, yeah. dead or if you could take their role as a, as a caregiver yeah. in the hospital. Yeah, and that, 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 it's, yeah, that's a very important thing that happened because uh, this is some, also might be cultural. I don't know how it is in other places, but we were asked, you know, false questions to see what would be our answers and to see if we would be able and in good mental capacity to leave the hospital with our kids. We didn't know that. I, at first I said, why this woman is asking me these questions, you know? And then my wife and I were said, can you believe she asked me that again? And then at, at, when we're about to leave the hospital, we understood because we became like best friends with a lot of nurses, you know, just like they are part of the family. And then they thought, no, we do this because you see sometimes, you know, parents, they go into a very bad time you know there's family complications the couples don't get along anymore parents just can ignore what's going on uh there's fights you know there there are people that have you know you know a thousand problems and then we need to assure that the kids will be taken home in good care and with you know all the security measures that they should but then at first i thought it was like almost an insult you know like, do you think I'm not going to take care of my kid? It's like a very reactive thing. I'm, I'm you know, hot-blooded person. So that might have <laughs> intensified a little bit. But uh, I thought it was like, that, that was too intrusive. And that intrusion started to bother us until we understood the, you know, the, the whole reason. mechanism. There, there was a mechanism, you know, as a cultural mechanism, because in Switzerland, people don't ask too much. Nice. So. Yeah, a lot of lessons learned for sure, right? So, but when you were all, uh, talking about the questions that we ask often, um, was that your biggest fear that you keep asking if the girls are going to survive? What was your biggest fear in the NICU as a dad? Because I think mothers and dads they have different fears yeah well something interesting because my wife she's a twin and she's also premature 
So she used to be much cooler than I was. And she used to tell me, no, don't be, just be cool. I mean, I, I'm here. So, <laughs> and, but my, my, my deepest fear was, you know, if they would not survive. Because for me, I mean, although my wife was a premature, I mean, you hear about prematurity, you hear friends that have had prematurity, but one thing is to hear, another thing is to be there and look at, I mean, I remember the first time they gave me a, a cloth for the, to wash them. I said, I cannot, I'm, I might break something, you know? So it was a, it was a constant state of, um, of fear. I mean, but the ultimate fear would be uh, they'll not survive. So. so were you engaged in the care of the babies? Were you able okay. to, you know, take the temperature, change their diapers, give them everything. a bath? Yeah, everything. But that was asked in the beginning. Would you like to, part how much do you want to participate? I remember that was asked. And I said, I want to participate on everything. I just, I don't do the milk thing, but you know, <laughs> the rest I, I can't. So, so, I mean, I just did everything, but in the beginning I, I needed to be, the only question I asked the nurse was, can you please guide me? Can you t please tell me what to do? And sometimes they had to repeat it because I remember the cloth, you know, the first, you know, wash was like very, very difficult. You know, like I was afraid to touch. I was afraid because I could have germs, you name it. Right. Thank you so much for sharing all this so candidly with us. And I, I think the, the next piece that I, I really love when I talk to you about is how you really talk about your emotions and how you cope with the NICU. So share with us what was your coping strategy for the few months that we spent in the hospital with the girls? Oh, a lot, a lot of strategy. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, I think the first, uh, I re all of these things you realize after you, you left the hospital. It, when you're in the hospital, the impression I had, it, I was an automatic pilot. I didn't even have time to think, you know? It was like, just go, 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 do, 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 you know? And then what, what really struck me in terms of uh, strategy was like, I started to read the emails with the pictures I used to send my friends. And for me, when I send the pictures of the kids, all the tubes and everything, I couldn't see the tubes. I was sending pictures as if they were like, you know, 40 weeks babies with no problems. And then I remember that my, uh, my brother spoke to me, he said, uh, oh, we, wow, 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 when you saw the pictures, we were like, woo. <laughs> so, well, you could, I'm glad you didn't tell me then because, you know, <laughs> so it was like, you know, I tried to see my kids, you know, with a different face, you know, I, it's like, clean up all the beeps and sounds and, you know, that light and just look at the good things, you know. So we bought those uh, dream catchers and we decorated the whole, the whole thing. And uh, it, was, it, it was just, you know, trying to look at them as if they had no problems. How about your journal? You have a big journal that you showed me before. Yes. That's a very interesting. And I, I, you see, I, I have fun reading this journal. Uh, when I opened it, I, I found the names of the, 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 the nurses and how I used to describe, because I didn't, some of them, I don't remember the name. So just to give you an example here, uh, there, was a, there was this one, uh, the, this, this, this with the big nose. <laughs> and then the other, the Swiss lady with the short hair and, large body this other one that was called uh with uh this uh, brazilian name this other one that had used to wear a rolex that was i was impressed and then i mean i just used to give you know this to this try to remember them yeah so i have all of them here and then the journal was something that really helped me really really helped me and the journal is something that is very organic because it, the kids, they still participate in the journal. So, you know, they, I, until the feet in the hand, they, they, they fit in the pages. We used to do the, you know, the feet and the page. They, they used to put the feet and the hands on the page with the dates. And they still, this is the first draw they made me. And then, uh, and then of course, they, they became much, <laughs> this is, this, 
one of the last ones. A little bit more elaborated than yeah, the first one. <laughs> more, yeah. and, and now they're writing in history. So it's, it's awesome. And it's something that, you know, uh, during the hospitalization, uh, I used to go back to the journal to day one, day two, day three, because, you know, you have the ups and downs. And when you're down, you reach for help. You, you need, you know, to find something to stick on. So I used to read back the, the journal and see, oh, we've been worse. So, you know, it's positive. So trying always to, you know, to get some basis to move on. But it was it wasn't a day-to-day -day basis. So, so is, was there any peer support in the hospital where you were there? No, unfortunately. And that's the reason I decided to put up this, uh, this whole thing, you know. And that that stroked me i mean that was I, 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 how i mean parents did and the more i go into this you know the more i find out with you know different professionals with um caregivers with uh, psychiatrists with psychologists with uh you know emergency room uh, nurses doctors i mean there is something that is missing there and it's missing for the fathers because the kid is being taken care of by the nurses, the mother is being taken care of by the nurses, and then all of a sudden the father doesn't find a role there. But even though you cleaned everything, you bought, you you brought the stuff to the hospital, I mean, you went to the paperwork, but at a certain moment, you're just, you know, they kind of look at you, so time to, you know, and then you move to the little sofa in the, you know, the, in the area, and I try to engage with uh, fathers there, but no, nobody really, you know, interacted. I don't know. It was, I, that was surprising for me. So do you think now uh, with your, um, the launch of Hospital Dad, it is online platform that you're creating to connect those dads. This is the goal that you have to connect fathers while they're still in the ICU or when they are navigating the transitioning from hospital to home or the fathers who are home with their babies in the first year because the first year is just as challenged for a lot of families as it is in the ICU. As you mentioned, the time where you start processing what really happened and you get out of the pilot automatic pilot mode to really leave the life oh this is you gotta deal with this now yeah i think um the i think the, the idea is for all fathers i mean not even not necessarily that you know they have kids that you know that the kids have grown and they are adults now uh, I, there, there are two gentlemen above their 60s that you know reached out and you know we were discussing and the way they they wrote me stuff it's like their kids were still one year old meaning that you know for all those years those traumas or those you know those things that were hidden in there maybe because they're men you know and from another generation so how bad it is and then, so, so the idea is, you know, as long, it also another thing that came up is that not necessarily if you're a, a father, you, you can be the uncle, you can be the grandfather, anything you are related to that child, because sometimes the grandparents, mm -hmm. they take a role as fathers. Absolutely. And, and it's open to that. So, but what is your vision with that, Alex? Because I think you have a big vision and you're yeah. getting started with this. You're going to register as a foundation. So how do you see that unfolding in the years from now? Yeah. So ideally, uh, well, as I told you, you know, uh, I was with this project held back for eight years. And this Corona thing, uh, we had more time at home. Uh, we're just, you know, going through old, old paperwork. And then I found the, you know, the, the documents from the hospital you start to read the diary the journal and then uh i said you know what it's, it's about time to to go on with it you know and, and it's something that my wife really likes and she wanted to you know engage into this for a long time and then we 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 had that first conversation or chat and from there uh i was already you know with the the instagram profile and now we're going to put up a Facebook profile, which is the one that I did today. 
we'll have a YouTube channel that we can have, you know, the information stored there as well. And the idea is to put up a concrete uh, format for that, either an association or a, a foundation. It, it depends. I'm, I'm, next week, I'll have some chats with, you know, interesting actors in order to help me out or what would be the good configuration. But yes, once this is this is um, this is put put on, it's uh, done. Then we'll move into you know reaching out, not only in Switzerland, but you know, my intention is to go to places that people don't have the same access that we have. That that's what brings more for me, you know, because uh, I mean we, could, we the coronavirus was a very good experience to see how many disparities there are mm -hmm. and i think you know premature babies they come the met doesn't matter where if it's conflict zone natural disaster poor countries doesn't matter and you know those parents they will go into the same thing as everyone else and they deserve the same kind of treatment and absolutely and, and you did and you you do write in four different languages which is amazing is english French, Spanish, and Portuguese, which is your, uh, you know, your native language, which is so important for fathers. And if they want to find on Instagram, it's Hospital Daddy. Is that correct? D A D D Y. It's Hospital Underline Daddy. So uh, they can find and follow you and join your uh, yeah, online yeah, network. Pleasure. And the idea <laughs> is that we could do, you know, Zoom calls with with fathers and once a month, something like that, you know, all around the world. That is so wonderful because yeah. I know here in Canada, a lot of fathers, they do uh, reach out to us and ask what is for us, what is available for us. And I know there's some hospitals in Canada doing uh, daddy's nights and they connect, they go, you know, just to discuss life in general, uh, which is so very important for fathers because it does affect fathers' mental health. And this is yeah. the next thing I want to talk to you before. Yeah. Uh, we finished this because you share with me very openly that you did suffer from PTSD and you did yeah. get help. So yeah. let's talk about that because I think that is so very important for fathers to recognize when is the time to look for help mm -hmm. and actually get the help they need. Yeah, I think, I think uh, well, the twins were born and I was just, I just joined my new job in a big bank. And I was there for three months, you know? And so the stress I was going through at work, you know, getting to know the corporation, the new, everything, new job, new job. And then with the twins and the hospital, and, you know, uh, we had, uh, by law, Switzerland gives you one day off, but the bank gave me a full week. But after a week, you know, I had to go back to work. So coping with stress of work, plus the situation that is super stressful in the hospital, then I was just like, oh, I, I remember the, the, when I noticed I needed help was when I was just, you know, I used to put one uh, pen, uh, one trouser, the, the trouser and the jacket from my costume in different colors, or I used to just pile you know, all the mail that arrived. I mean, I just, I, I, I didn't have time or brains to look at that. So, and then I started to, okay, so now it's time. So I spoke to a very good friend of ours. Uh, he's a doctor, he's, you know, it's a bit older than us. And they rec uh, recommended me someone that was amazing. You know, a psychiatrist that by chance spoke Portuguese and Spanish. So, uh, because, you know, when you're, you know, in with your therapist and you speak another language, a lot can be missed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had the chance to have someone that spoke Portuguese. That was super important and helped me a lot. That is so wonderful. That is so wonderful that you recognize that and you, you look for help. And I think this is a message for all the fathers out yeah. there that is very hard sometimes to reach for help, right? Because we 
I feel, I see from my own experience with my husband that you have to be strong and you have to, you know, keep the control of the home and make sure the bills are paid and the house is taken care of. And you don't really look in yourself and say, I, how about me? Right. Because you have to be this protector has this protector role that is so hard for that in that situation when you actually lose total control and it's not on your hands. And then you have to look at yourself and say, I, I matter too. And I am so grateful that we are able to connect and you share all of that with us and all the fathers uh, across Canada. And hopefully you can share this video with your community of fathers as well. But yes. as I wanted to give one last message for dads who mm -hmm. are currently in the NICU or just being discharged to home, because this is a very difficult time. And I see it's hard no matter what, but I think the pandemic has added an extra layer of stress yeah. in the families, not only a mental stress, but also emotional, um, financial, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen uh, from now on. So is there a message you can give to those dads that, you know, give them some hope to continue in this journey? Uh, first of all, I would say reach out. Reach out to whoever. I mean, uh, the platform is there. If you want to reach out, reach out. We'll be more than happy to discuss with you, WhatsApp with you, reach out. And it's, sometimes it's good because it, it, it's a bit far away from the whole thing, you know. If you reach out to another that is in the same uh, NICU, you might be connected with in, in, you know, the doctors. And so being away from that, you can have a more clear view of the whole thing. So reaching out, I think it's very important. Second thing, uh, do a journal. Just do a journal. I mean, this, this is super helpful. Uh, I never imagined I would have a journal and the journal is still going on. And I have loads of fun with my kids. They're just, you know, doing drawings and they ask and then, you know, I can relate the pictures with the, what, what, what the feeling I had that day when I took that picture. So journaling, uh, reaching out to people and just stay sure that, you know, things will settle down. It's just, uh, when people used to tell me that I wanted to knock them. <laughs> but <laughs> the, truth is, the truth is, this is true. Things will come down. Okay, Alex, thank you so much for joining Pleasure. us here today. Uh, it was lovely talking to you and I'm looking forward to see your project unfolding and helping many dads are, are all over the world, actually. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And uh, to everyone who's watching us, don't hesitate to reach if you need or if you want to. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana. It was a pleasure. And thank you everyone at home uh, for watching us here today. Uh, we will be back on Monday. I'll be inter interviewing Dr. Uh, Andrew Hollett. He's a psychiatrist and he has this amazing platform on father's mental health. So we're gonna be talking to a, a lot about that next week. And on Wednesday, Kate Robson is hosting an online real-time peer support group. And to access that group, you can join the Canadian Premier Parent Support Network, which is our private Facebook group. And next Friday, uh, June the 19th, Jonathan Foster, you'll be hosting a dad's group in real time. Uh, stay tuned in our social media channels to get the link for that group. So thank you everyone and have a lovely weekend. Thank you too. too.